So it's going to be fairly interactive. You're going to see a lot of black spaces. Um, and so those who are free and can unmute themselves, feel free to talk. Those who are not able to talk, um, feel free to chat. And then Rafa, if you can uh, man the chat for me and then feel free to interrupt at any point. Um, we're just going to basically walk through one case and I'm going to try to get some of your thoughts on what you guys would do if you were admitting this patient. It's not going to be a bunch of cases. It's just going to be one case we're going to try to dissect. Um, are most cameras on? Oh, wow. This is great. Awesome. Bruno is even so dedicated. He's walking through the hospital listening to us. Um, it's perfect. Thanks, Bruno. Um, all right. So um, here's your case that you're going to walk through over this hour. You have a 68-year-old woman with a history of congestive heart failure and mild dementia who lives in a nursing home. And the nursing home sends her in because she's been more confused. This is every night float admission, right? They always send them in around 7 p.m. And then the nocturnist always assigns it at 9 p.m. Um, so she appears, you go to the bedside in the emergency room. She appears a little bit tachypnic. But when you ask her, she tells you she's not short of breath. She says she's always had a bit of a cough coming and going. She's it's non-productive, but she's not really sure if it's new or if she's always had it. Um, sort of typical dementia patient. Um, and she's lethargic, but she's able to wake up easily for you. Um, you check her vital signs. Her temperature is 100. Her heart rate's the same, 100. Not very imaginative when I write a question. Uh, blood pressure is 108 over 64. Um, she's breathing at 24 a minute. You're an astute intern, so you actually stand there for a whole minute and you, you check her respiratory rate and you notice that she's standing 90% on room air. Um, you know that she has heart failure, so you look for her JVD, but you're not able to see it. You listen to her lungs, you think there's possibly some crackles. Um, and you notice some mild lower extremity edema. Then you look at her numbers. She's got a white count of 10.2, a hematocrit of 32, platelet count of 240, <clears throat> sodium of 130, <clears throat> creato 1 1.4, LFTs are normal. You look at her urine analysis. She has four to six uh, white blood cells. <clears throat> Luke trace is negative. And then of course you look at her portable chest x-ray um, and it, it looks like it has some pulmonary edema and then the radiologist comments, it may or may not have a left lower lobe infiltrate, recommend clinical correlation. And the nocturnist says to you, here you go, community acquired pneumonia or some pneumonia coming in from the nursing home, please admit this patient. This is the chest x-ray. Um, who's going into radiology? If I remember, I would call out, but I, would, I don't see in this list if anyone's going to that. Mm. Yeah, I don't, I don't see anyone going to that. Anyway, does anyone want to read it? Just unmute yourselves and read it. I don't mind giving it a try. Thanks, Tom. Yep. So uh, I usually try to stick with the A, B, C, D, E method. So airway, airway looks uh, midline and uh, fairly intact. Uh, so then I look at bones. I don't see any obvious evidence of like clavicular fractures or scapular issues. Ribs all look relatively fine. Uh, so next is cardiac. So I look at the cardiac. Uh, it does not look that magnified. I don't see like any obvious signs of like cardiomegaly or anything like that. So I think we're good there. Next, I look for any obvious air under the diaphragm or just the diaphragms in general. Um, I see pretty clean costophrenic angles. They're maybe a little bit blurry, but not that bad. Um, and then so everything else. Uh, so I think uh, I see some haziness bilaterally in middle and lower lobes. The upper lobes look pretty clean to me. Um, so I would say that this is maybe some mild like congestion. Uh, I don't see you know an obvious single focal lobular uh, consolidation or anything like that that's blaring or screaming at me. Yeah, wonderful job and thanks Tom. Um, <clears throat> exactly, so this is typically morning rounds, right? I look at the chest x-ray and I'm like, where is it? Where is the pneumonia that we're treating? Um, all right, so um, so does this patient have pneumonia? I, don't know. I mean, that's what she's going to ask me when I show up to her bedside, right? Um, and most of the times we're on the wards. I think a third year resident said to me, they're like, what do hospitals even do? What do they do? 
They're, do you call a consultant? No, no, we don't just call consultants. We think for ourselves. Um, and so this is what you've been taught in med school, right? To make the diagnosis of a pneumonia, you have to have a fever, a cough, you've got to be producing some sputum, short of breath. Maybe they tell you they have some pleuritic chest pain. You look for hypoxia, you try to listen for crackles. Um, I don't know if this generation knows what bronchial breath sounds are, but bronchial breath sounds are when there's a sort of a large enough consolidation that when the air moves through that consolidated lung, it actually sounds as though the air is moving in the upper airways. And so it's louder than a normal breath sounds would be. Egophony, which is compared to the bleeding of a sheep. Again, you, you guys probably just put a focus on the lung and kind of over this, all this stuff. But egophony would be like sort of the E sound changing to the ah sound, kind of like the bleeding if you ever go to the central park zoo of sheep so you can listen to what a golfing sounds like um and then some dullness if you have a sort of paranormonic effusion then you're looking for leukocytosis and you're looking for imaging findings obviously and so really is this is this true is this what you're doing when you're actually admitting patients to to, to the wards it's not um you you don't get this beautiful cons you know constellation you're usually struggling to put the pieces together. And so this is um, a really nice poster that I found um, that they presented at ID week um, three years ago, where they put together about 10,000 patients with pneumonia. This is all sort of New England, uh, Boston data. Um, and they noticed that 80% had a temperature less than 38 degrees. So that's less than 100 degrees. 82% were breathing quite comfortably in less than, less than 22 breaths a minute. 60% had a white count less than 12,000, and 53% were chilling on room air, uh, and 40% had an O2 sat greater than 95%, so really about 10% may have been hypoxic. Um, and so if you looked at everything together, all signs were normal and close to 28%. So one in three patients had all signs normal. So it's not an easy diagnosis to make, right, despite what we've been told in med school. Um, and so let's assume that the radiologist is right and I can't see the pneumonia, um, but she has a pneumonia. Let's, let's assume that's true, um, especially if you go back to the stem um, and you, you take into account that she may have a, a new cough. She's a little hypoxic. She's a little tachypnic. Um, the radiologist is telling me she, she has a pneumonia. If she does have a pneumonia, what kind of pneumonia is it? Here are the definitions. So, so tell me what kind she has. Um, and Neha, do you want to give it a shot? Uh, um, I mean, it's not hospital acquired because she just got in. It's not ventilator acquired because she's currently not on a mechanical ventilator. So I just say community acquired pneumonia. Yeah, precisely. And, and the reason I'm asking you guys to define it is because my generation, when the 2005 ID guidelines uh, for pneumonia came out, um, the IDSA guidelines, they had included this, this last term that I've put down in the gray, which is healthcare associated pneumonia, which used to be known as HCAP. So in 2005, they introduced that term. And so anyone coming in from a nursing home would be labeled with HCAP, right? But in the 2019 IDSA pneumonia, community acquired pneumonia guidelines, HCAP has been done away with. And so I just want you guys to be very cognizant of the fact that now you're just thinking very broadly, you're saying, is this community acquired coming from the community or is this hospital acquired? This person was admitted more than two days ago, more than 48 hours ago, and it, it was acquired in the hospital. Or, you know, they were just in the hospital last week and they were just released less than a few days ago and they're now back with a pneumonia. Um, and so, stop thinking about healthcare acquired pneumonia is my point. So yes, she's coming in with a community acquired pneumonia, exactly like Neha said. And so the next thing that I'm doing right in my mind is I'm, I'm standing at this person's bedside and I'm saying, fine, let's buy. She has a pneumonia. She has a community acquired pneumonia. Do I think it's viral or bacterial? Or if you want to really be, um, you know, imaginative, is it fungal or mycobacterial? Um, Juan, what do you think? What kind of pneumonia does this little old lady have? I would say viral. Viral. And, and why did you make that guess? Because there's no appear infiltrate in the chest x-ray. Okay, that's a good one. Any other reasons? 
And so for me, the way I think about it is, it is you know, what data do we have, right? Where do we, where do we live in practice uh, and what do we see the most of? Um, and so if you look at uh, this article back from 2015, which again, the, these are patients from five hospitals in Chicago and then Nashville, so very different cities, um, and close to 2,500 patients, most of these pneumonias actually turned out, be, turned out to be viral. Um, more than 23%, right? So now out of 2,500 patients, they only really got um, specimens, like positive specimens in less than 40%. So 60%, they never found causality. But in the 40% where they found causality, the majority, as you can see, rhinovirus, which is the top of the list at close to 9%, almost 10%, um, flu, right? So that's um, another 6%. And then I'm going to skip over strep pneumo down to metanumovirus, RSV, parainfluenza. Obviously, this is not coronavirus that we have come to know and detest. Um, it is, um, is the old coronavirus. Um, and then the rest of the bacteria that you can see. So majority viral. And, and why do you think we're living in a majority viral pneumonia era? Was it always like this? This, this data is like all from 2010 onwards use of antibiotics yeah so exactly like you said we're living in the antibiotic era but we're also living in the post streptococcal vaccine era uh, or pneumococcal vaccine era right so ever since uh, we've implemented widespread pneumococcal vaccination the incidence of the leading cause of pneumonia has plummeted right um and i really like this uh, anyone practicing hospital medicine has probably seen this. It's from the same article, but it, it illustrates really nicely what um, pathogen you're looking for at what, at what point of the year. Um, and so, you know, you can see your little flu peaks um, that um, kind of peak every winter. Interesting thing is they don't peak in the same months every winter, right? So you, you'll hear hospitals complain, this January is way worse than last January. Right. So it seems to, to vary a little bit year to year. And then obviously every time the flu peaks, um, you guys have come to learn that staff peaks, right? Because there's a lot of post viral staphylococcal pneumonia. Um, and, and we teach staff, you know, we teach this a lot that you, you should always be looking for staph pneumonia post flu, but there's a lot of increase also in strep pneumo pneumonia post viral infections. And so you're seeing a lot of that with COVID now is that They'll be hospitalized with COVID, you'll release them and they come back with a bacterial pneumonia or they develop a bacterial pneumonia while still in the hospital. Um, and the leading causes are usually staph, strep. Pseudomonas is not on here, but we'll talk about it shortly. Um, and so this is, again, we're still talking about the same article that we had started talking about. 60% um, <clears throat> had no pathogen identified, but the majority had a viral pathogen identified, so almost 25%. Um, about 11% had bacterial pathogens identified, and then there's a small minority that had fungal or AFB. Um, it is important to remember, and I, I don't have to teach you guys this because you're kind of like the COVID generation, that bacterial and viral pneumonias coexist. And so it's important to always think of that when you're treating. Um, and uh, did anyone think, um, no one here thought that this would be a hospital acquired pneumonia, right? because I think the most you would think is of age cap, but this lady definitely doesn't have a hospital acquired pneumonia. But let's pause for a second and look at this um, data here. This is about 250 patients, um, all of whom were classified as developing pneumonia more than 48 hours into their hospitalization. Um, and here are some of their um, either tracheal aspirates or um, expectorated uh, specimens. And so the leading cause right here um, is pseudomonas, real uh, star bug here. Um, and then the second close is not MRSA actually, but MSSA, so methicillin sensitive staph. Um, and then MRSA is a, a, you know, kind of trying to inch in to becoming a leading, but not there yet. Again, this data is from several years ago, and really what you should be relying on more than this data is your own antibiogram for where you're practicing. So if you're practicing here right now, having the antibiogram from your pharmacy of what are the most common isolates uh, can be enormously helpful. Um, and so this is who you, 
sort of work and live with. Um, so recently I had strep throat. Um, I, I kept working, kept getting COVID tests every day. I was fine. And one day I was just like, my throat feels like it's on fire. Um, so I had, I had a swab done. I was like, I bet you I caught this in the hospital. Um, all right. So we're at the point where we've classified it as a community acquired pneumonia. Um, we thought about some of the uh, pathogens that could contribute. Um, you guys are still down in the emergency room. You've had all of this little cognitive process for a measly little pneumonia. What would you do next? Uh, Bailey, do you want to give it a go? I was actually just thinking about this. I don't know if I would start antibiotics just to kind of prophylactically treat or hold off. Um, since we think that it could be possibly viral. Um, but then we were saying also bacterial probably coexists, you know, sometimes with viral um, as well. So I feel like I would at least treat, or if not, the ED would have given a dose of azithro or something. Yeah, great point. I, and I, yeah, I think, you know, it's, it's so tempting. And I, I see most of my residents do this is to jump to treatment right just decide whether you're going to treat or not and if you're going to treat or not what are you going to treat with but there are things you can do before that right you've been given a chest x-ray you've been given some basic data here let me go back to the stem and and you know if your senior resident walked in to supervise you with this case they're going to point out that this person has like two out of four search criteria right um which is why also the ED treats, right? Like the ED is not a bunch of dumb docs. The ED, ED is a bunch of brilliant docs that's really geared towards uh, minimizing mortality. Um, and so, so you're seeing some blips of the SIRS criteria lighting up um, and you have some rudimentary information. I guess the question is before you jump to treatment, do you want more information? Um, Thais, do you wanna unmute and talk? Yeah, no, I was thinking actually, because uh, her symptoms might also be associated to her heart failure. So I would also order like BNP, uh, Procal, which there are some studies that uh, show that might help differentiate between bacterial and viral pneumonia. Uh, Another thing that I thought since she has like criteria for SIRS and she has a possible source, probably I would start treating as bacteria and then uh, assessing her, maybe discontinue antibiotics after that. But I would definitely consider other possibilities to uh, check if she has an, a prior TTE to see her ejection fraction uh something like that but that her symptoms might also be because of her heart failure not necessarily because of her pneumonia excellent yeah and in a program where one in four go into cardiology i almost never have to ask for a tte or a bnp like i walk in in the morning and they're like this has got to be heart failure i'm like no but it could also be infection um yeah. all right so good good uh i would do exactly the same things i think you know it's important initially when you're making your evaluation to keep your differential very broad um, and to think about, you know, outside of that organ that is screaming, I'm infected, there could easily be other things in the neighborhood that are causing trouble. Um, so yes, I, I agree I would get a BNP. Uh, the Procal, let, we could talk about it further. I think we're going to spend five minutes talking about Procals. And then my question for you guys is, would you get sputum cultures? Would you get the urine Legionella antigen, urine strep antigen? Would you get uh, blood cultures? Would you get... Um, um, you know, a sputum gram stain, you know, because they come back much quicker than a sputum culture. Is that something you guys have been doing? Has that been helpful? Is it a complete waste of time? You're going to treat anyway? What's the general opinion? Ali, what do you, I really heavily rely on Ali's opinions. Um, what do you think? <laughs> you just gave me the brow. <laughs> I mean, this is somebody who maybe question mark has some sputum production. So if it's possible to sample that you could, if it's readily, readily available, but other than that, I mean, she doesn't really have too high of a white counter. At least that's what I recall. And then, you know, you could see from there, just monitor her for a bit. And I don't think she has a fever either. So I wouldn't 
like a hundred. Leaning towards going towards. Yeah, she's got a fever here. of one hundred, and she's got a white count of ten point two. Yeah, so yeah. not exciting. She's not That's screaming at you. All right. Um. So, uh, important thing to remember is if you were doing this at the Ryan's, right? There's no role for collecting any of this micro data. You're just going to empirically treat. But in the inpatient setting. Um, the IDSA guidelines do recommend that you collect this data for, especially for severe pneumonia. So if you have a patient going to the ICU, you must collect this data. And then the second set of people that you must collect this data for is when you have a suspicion that this may be MRSA or pseudomonas. Uh, and really that is because it, you know, down the line, day two or three of hospital stay, it's going to allow for de-escalation of antibiotics. Uh, personally, if you have a pneumonia, I like this data collected on every pneumonia. Now, I'm not saying you need to get a blood culture on someone who doesn't look septic, but exactly like Ali said, if they're if they're able to expectorate a sputum, get a non-invasive sputum culture, uh, a sputum gram stain. A urine legionella is a really cheap test. A urine strep, which unfortunately our institution doesn't have, is a really cheap and quick test that actually comes back sooner than the blood culture. Um, so those are sort of things to consider if you are considering a pneumonia. I'm sure you've all seen um, sort of the criteria to define um, severe pneumonia. The interesting thing is in the 2019 guidelines, they still quoted the tw uh, 2007 guidelines. So the criteria haven't changed. Um, and so if they're in septic shock and they need vasopressors or if they're getting intubated, it's severe pneumonia, right? Oh, shit. Of course it is. Uh, minor criteria, a little bit harder to, rem to remember, but this I believe is available on MD Calc. So you don't have to memorize this, but they'll look sick to you. They're gonna be breathing over 30 a minute. They're gonna have a completely botched PO2, FiO2 ratio. You're gonna see multi low bar infiltrates. You're not with this, with this patient. They're gonna be confused, disoriented. The BUN is gonna be over 20. A white count's gonna be really low. Plate count's gonna be low. They're going to maybe hypothermic, hypotensive, yada, yada. Um, do you guys know easier um, criteria than this? I'm sure you do. Someone throw a few at me. I like curb 65. Like, yeah, I same. was lazy like you once. Good job. <laughs> <laughs> it's nice, it's easy to remember. Yeah, do you want to, uh, Nadim, tell us what the curb 65 stands for? So the C is for confusion. Um, this patient seems does have some deviation from her baseline. Good. The U is uremia, so I think a BUN of more than 20. Mm -hmm. R is respiratory rate, so I think the cutoff is higher than 30. Good. And then what is the B then? The BUN. Oh, the BUN. Oh, wait, that was the uremia. What yeah. is the B? Blood, blood pressure. pressure. Blood, blood pressure. pressure. So, blood pressure. Thank you. Um, this patient doesn't have any deviation. This doesn't. Um, Good, yeah. So systolic usually less than 90 is considered uh, positive. And then 65 is age over 65. So perfect. So like you said, like you see, like Nadim said, uh, four out of these criteria is in the CURP 65. And so this is slightly more extensive. Um, and so uh, very often when I would say, here are the criteria, people would say to me, well, you know, you're, you're talking very broadly, be more specific where you really want um, micro data. And so let's go over this one more time. So if you have severe cap based on the, that criteria, if you are going to start them on cefepime vancomycin, right? So if you decided to empirically treat for pseudomonal and MRSA pneumonia, get micro data. If you know, based on, on your excellent EPIC uh, micro tab review details that they've previously been infected with MRSA and pseudomonas, you want to recollect that data. And, if, and when you know they've been hospitalized within the past 90 days and or received antibiotics within those past 90 days, you want to collect this data because very often we start worrying that those people are colonized and that might be leading to infection. Um, so you've seen her and you're like, you know, these ED docs, they want to admit everything. I would send this person home, right? I mean, we all walk in in the morning and say, why was this admitted, right? Um, so again, this is just a quick, um, these are quick links. When I send you my PowerPoint, you can click on these. If you, I'm sure you guys know this already is you don't have to guess and you don't have to argue. There are clinical prediction tools that are accurate. that work really well. You can whip them out. You can do the math and you can be like, Hey, ED doc, I would like to send this person home. Right. Or, Hey, actually you shouldn't be calling the floors. You should be calling the ICU. Right. Okay. 
Um, so you're presenting this patient the next morning at rounds. Uh, by some miracle um, in the round robin distribution, you admitted this patient and actually kept the patient the next morning, right? Like, which never happens anymore, but that happened. What good luck. And so your med student is, um, you know, listening to your presentation and saying, why didn't you get a CT, right? And then your senior resident is looking at your attending going, yeah, 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 I'll get that MRSA swab, you don't worry. Um, and then your attending's like, what's the Procal? Like, I'm already bored of your presentation. It's been going on too long, right? So, so does someone want to say to, to tell me, maybe Salvador, um, does this woman need a chest CT? Me personally, I don't think she requires a CT, especially because she's uh, stable. Like if there is any new clinical deterioration, I might consider it, but for now, uh, I, I don't think she requires one. Good, good. So, and again, you know, this is, this is data that I'm discussing with you guys, which is not specific to this case, obviously, right? But again, just kind of broadening your mind on how to think about these investigations. So. Um, this was uh, published in the Journal of Chest, um, and they, this is, again, six years ago. They looked at 300 patients that the emergency room doc had a high suspicion had pneumonia, and then they put them through first a chest x-ray, and uh, the radiologist, you know, how they love to, like, say either possible or probable, like, drives me nuts. I'm like, what is possible and what is probable? Um, but this is what the radiologist classified it as, and so... Um, out of the 319, 188 actually had a parenchymal infiltrate. And out of that uh, 188, uh, 143 had a def definite pneumonia. And then another uh, 170 together, so if you add these two columns up, had either probable or possible pneumonia. I like it. Yeah, don't ask me what means. What's the meaning of probable and possible? Maybe there's an English major here who can tell us. Um, and then, again, this was a sort of randomized control trial, right? So this wasn't um uh this wasn't because of clinical suspicion this was just done for all 319 patients then all of those 319 patients were put through a cat scan okay and this is what happened after the cat scans were read a good number so close to 50 percent of the 173 of the probable and possible pneumonias were excluded as having pneumonias a good number were ruled in and then with, even with the definite pneumonia, there was a small percentage that was ruled out as having a pneumonia, very small. So really where it matters is the probable and possible, right? Um, and so if you can remember this data, and again, this is not our patient CT, this is just a random CT I borrowed from the internet. Um, but uh, in my experience with little old people, um, they fail to mount white counts they fail to produce sort of a robust productive cough. Uh, and they sometimes even fail to mount those impressive fevers. Um, and so I completely agree with Salvador. I think if this woman just stayed stable on her, let's say that um, Ty started her in the emergency room and con continued her on a beta lactam and a atypical coverage, like a macro light or a doxy, whatever she chose, um, and then you took over in the morning and she looked fine and she felt good, I wouldn't do this. But if you took over in the morning and Tyus didn't start her on antibiotics and she's mounting a fever to 101, I would, I would trigger a CT. And again, because it's giving you clues on what to do next, right? So everyone doesn't need a CT, but some people do. Um, and then because you're such a good intern, right? You're like this all-star intern. You're like, yes, you know, let me tell you a little bit about Marissa Swab, senior resident. Um, they have a great negative predictive value and they actually have a great specificity. I think I forgot to put the specificity here, but the specificity is over 90% as well. And so with that good of a negative predictive value and specificity, let's say that this woman's wearing a little MRSA bracelet because her nursing home is like, she has MRSA colonization, right? Um, it's a no brainer. You're going to treat her with vancomycin, but let's say she's not. Um, and you're worried about her for whatever reason, she decompensates overnight, someone threw her on vancomycin. Getting that MRSA swab is really helpful because it will come back in 24 hours and you can get rid of the, the vancomycin. And again, the whole goal here is antibiotic stewardship. And then to Tyus's, um point, right? Like, do we get a Procal? Do we not get a Procal? To the extent when we went to the, uh, to the you know, quality improvement council in our hospital, and we're like, we really want a point of care. 
uh, ProCal. It's really going to change clinical practice. They're like, have you read the 2018 NEJM article? No, you don't need it. It's expensive. We're not giving it to you. Um, that said, now we've lived through the COVID era, right? We've like spent this whole year trying to uh, be as good as we can about withholding antibiotics and only giving them as needed. And so I think this generation, again, I don't need to treat, uh, sort of teach you guys about ProCalis, but the important thing to learn about a ProCal is it can be helpful when you're in doubt, right? So if you had a slam dunk pneumonia, you don't need a ProCal. Um, if you have a crashing sick patient in the ICU that's, that you're throwing the kitchen sink at and you're treating everything, you don't need a ProCal. You're going to treat them with everything you've got. But it's these people where like they're looking kind of nice, they're breathing kind of comfortably, they keep mounting that little bit of fever and they don't quite feel like themselves where you're like, fine, I'm going to start some antibiotics, but I'm going to try to clarify if this is viral or not, right? And so anything less than 0.1, your first bar here, um, you can say with a good amount of confidence that it's unlikely to be bacterial. For me personally in the COVID era, the 0.1s become the cutoff. Even though pre-COVID, I used to practice with 0.25 or less as a cutoff. Uh, Post-COVID, I don't wanna miss this little section here uh, that goes over 0.1. Does that make sense? And then obviously, like this used to be an ICU cutoff at one point, 0.5. Over 0.5, you're, you're probably dealing with a bacterial pneumonia. Um, and so again, it's, it's up to sort of clinical discretion what you want to use, whether you want to use 0.1, you want to use 0.25, or you want to use 0.5. Um, I personally advise you to use 0.1. That's where you're missing the least. Okay. Um, we're going to skip over this because we spent some time already. But the takeaway is the reason our quality improvement division didn't give it to us is because it didn't affect duration of antibiotics and it didn't affect um, uh, you know, who you started on antibiotics for most part um, in this very, very good randomized controlled trial uh, that was published in 2018. Um, <clears throat> and then can I, just, can I just ask then, so we are not recommending doing procalcitonin, correct? Not routinely, correct. Okay, good. Because there's yes. been no study that's actually showed it's useful for anything. And for most of it, I'll just say. It's different though, John, in clinical practice, and you'll see that a lot with the COVID patients, is um, it's important to know, you know, if you're treating viral pneumonia or bacterial pneumonia, because if you put all of these patients on like beta-lactams, yada, yada, ultimately you'll have this microbiome that's just multi-drug resistant. And so it can be helpful if you don't know what you're doing. It's not routinely recommended. You should know what you're doing. I'm just going to say, but I'll shut up. The whole point of my lecture is that you don't know what you're doing. All right. Um, so just like John, there was an annoying interruption, this pharmacy student <laughs> who asks you, well, you've done a great job. Like, you know, you've now answered the medical students annoying CT question and you've answered the uh, senior residents MRSA question and even your attending stupid ProCal question. But did you check a flu and a COVID? And that viral PCR, did you do that one? And you're just like, man, I've had it. Like, it's just a pneumonia. Can we, can we move on? Um, and so, uh, again, this is similar data to what we were looking at before, but rapid viral PCR panels actually didn't make a difference in uh, whether or not physicians chose to start antibiotics. And there wasn't a difference in the mean duration of antibiotics. But um, it, made, it made a couple of... Uh, a couple of differences. So more patients in the viral PCR group received less than two days of antibiotics, right? So you started someone um, on antibiotics, you check the viral PCR, it takes a day or two to come back and it comes back as rhinovirus, you stop their antibiotics, right? So again, just good stewardship. And it actually cut off a day um, of hospitalization. So again, this is not the popular opinion, but a lot of hospitalists will recommend you check a viral PCR because so much pneumonia is viral. Okay. And so uh, back to where Bailey was, which is how are you going to treat this, right? You've got a woman, um, really should just put the question stem back in at some point. Uh, you've got a woman who's 68. Um, I showed you the CT. So now you know you have it, you have a pneumonia. It's possibly bilateral, it possibly had a paranomonic effusion on the, on the right. Um, 
You've seen her vitals again. You've seen her O2 sat again. You've decided she's coming from the community. She's not coming from, uh, you know, she's not recently been hospitalized, hasn't recently been on antibiotics. What is your choice of antibiotics? Oh, sorry. That was a dead giveaway. It's simple, right? It's what you guys have been doing in this every day. You could rattle off these antibiotics in your sleep. Ceftriaxone, azithro. There you go. Richard's already over in Turnier. Um, yeah, exactly. So uh, I, I made this last year when I was first teaching this lecture, and I'm still very proud of this little slide. Um, basically, ceftriaxone azithro is the answer to all cap in the hospital, right? Um, so you can choose any IV beta lactam, and then you can add something for atypical coverage, which can either be a macrolide or doxycycline, or if you are allergic and so many people are wrongly labeled with these allergies, you can use a fluoroquinolone. Make sense? This is where we live in the hospital, right? And the people you should be hospitalizing are these people with CURP 65s over two or a PSI over three. Um, the flip side is, you know, your attending walks in in the morning and says, this, this person looks great. Let's send them back to the nursing home. Right. And so you, you should know what oral regimen you can follow. And this is the oral regimen, you, which is identical to the IV regimen. You just change it to PO. These two are essentially identical. The important thing to remember is these people that are getting this regimen, and this is the majority of your hospital admissions, are people with all of these comorbidities down here. So your heart failure patients, your COPDers, end stage renal disease, your diabetics liver disease, cancer, alcoholism, ones who don't have a spleen, they're immunosuppressed on 9A, um, or they've had antibiotics in the previous three months. So if you can understand this bit is really, these are the people who even need hospitalization, the rest of them don't. But this is all we see in patients is, is people with these comorbidities. Does that make sense? If for whatever reason you um, suspect that there may be a pseudomonal infection or MRSA infection, um, then you will treat obviously with different antibiotics, right? Um, and this is sort of difficult to determine, right? Some of this is easy. Um, if you have someone on long-term dialysis, if you have an intravenous drug user, if they tell you they just had flu last month or they were treated with a fluoroquinolone for UTI, it's easy enough to predict that you need MRSA coverage. Um, you're not gonna see GPCs on clusters till the day, till the next day. Um, you may not see a necrotizing or cavitary pneumonia on a plain chest x-ray. You may need, you know, um, a CT for that. But these are some of the things that should sort of trigger you in the direction of thinking about treating for MRSA until you get the, the MRSA swab. Um, and similarly for pseudomonas, people with structural lung disease, this is one you should never miss. If they tell you they have a history of bronchiectasis or you did a charge review and it shows up, uh, think about uh, think about pseudomonal coverage. Similarly with COPD, very often I'll see these COPDers flying in and out of the hospital, um, and no one ever thinks about pseudomonal coverage, even though they are they are frequently colonized and then infected with pseudomonas. Um, and so this is your usual choice. I think you guys know this by now. Um, at West and Morningside, we're always telling you to do cefepime because the antibiotic police will not give you uh, zosin. Uh, so cefepime is sort of your, your go-to if they're allergic. Again, and a lot of people carry beta-lactam tagged allergies on their charts. Um, you go down to astrionam or the penems. Yeah. And then uh, MRSA is easier, vancomycin for everyone. We started calling it vancopeme, right? Or there's another nickname for uh, zosin and vancomycin, which I can't remember. Anyway, so vancomycin, um, if for whatever reason they get like Redmond syndrome or something horrible, you can use linazolid. The thing to remember about linazolid though, is that it's not bactericidal, it's bacteriostatic. I don't even know why this little piece of information stuck in my mind, but it is. And then the thing to remember about daptomycin is that it really doesn't have good lung penetration. So I put it on the list, but I really shouldn't, I should strike it off. Um, and so your senior resident says, hey, um, Ceftriax and Ocitro sounds great. Should we switch her to Unison? She's, she's old, she's demented, she's probably aspirating. Sona, what do you think about a possibility of aspiration? Um, yeah, given her... Uh dementia and given her cough with sputum, I 
I would think that it's a possibility. Um, but she doesn't have any clinical um, signs of like, yeah, um, I, I would see if she would is getting better on Ceph as a throw. And if not, then I would add uh, coverage for anaerobic organisms also. Yeah, it's typically what we do. We're like shrug life, right? We're like, um, I don't know, she looks okay. Maybe some flagell, maybe not, who knows? Um, good, I mean, I, I think, I think that's, that's pretty much what the hospital does all the time. So I think it's important to remember that, um, again, I'm talking about pneumonia versus pneumonitis, right? Uh, there's a lot of aspiration that's simply chemical aspiration that gives you pneumonitis. And so this is, again, this is not randomized, this is a retrospective analysis um, for patients who were suspected to have an aspiration pneumonitis. They put 96 on them, um, on antibiotics and they put 124 on nothing, just supportive care. Uh, and there was no difference in hospital mortality. And this blows my mind. Uh, there was a big difference though in antibiotic escalation. So some of them revealed themselves to be true pneumonia and had to be started on antibiotics versus others who continued to be just on supportive care. Um, so it's, it's worth thinking about whether or not you even have a pneumonia or a pneumonitis. Um, back to what you said, about anaerobic coverage. Um, the IDSA 2019 guidelines do not recommend anaerobic coverage unless you have evidence of a underlying empyema or lung abscess. Those are the only reasons for which someone should be thrown on anaerobic coverage. That said, when you read up to date, and that's what you guys do all the time, and I'm very proud of you for doing it, it's a great resource. Up to date does recommend unison. And so your senior resident kind of has a point. They've been doing this longer. Um, and so finally, going into the murky realms of pneumonia, uh, let's say that um, like she's Salvador's patient and he's rounding and now she's febrile to 102, tachypnic to 30. Um, you've escalated her oxygen. She's now in five liters. She's looking sick. Um, you know, uh, Bailey even went ahead and brought in her coverage from Ceftriaxone or to, you know, vancopine, cefepime bank. Uh, you think you've done everything. And then the annoying medical student says, do you want to do steroids? They're not annoying. They're some of the best resources on a team. They always have great ideas. But um, let's see. Marillo is like really into this. Marillo, what would you do? I'm not sure. Maybe I think due to the progression of the disease, I think um, it would be a good shot to try for some short period. But I don't think this patient has a, a indication to corticosteroids at this moment. Good. What is what would be a good indication for corticosteroids? You think? I think it could be a poor response to the antibiotics in a setting of um, respiratory symptoms and decline. Good. One of the earliest hospitalist conferences I went to when I first started doing this was on the West Coast. And I was really surprised because I'd always trained on the East Coast, always practiced here, is that the West Coast hospitalists, they actually threw a lot of steroids at their pneumonias and their threshold for doing so was way lower. And so then I started reading some of the studies that they were quoting, and there were two big studies that came out, one in 2014 and then one a couple of years before that, that actually showed this enormous sort of improvement in the length of symptoms uh, for severe pneumonia. Again, you have to like fulfill that criteria we had reviewed, um, length of hospitalizations, um, everything. But then that could never be replicated. So there have been several studies since that 2014 study, which was such a uh, you know, kind of monumental study for hospitalists where they were like, oh, we should give more steroids to these people. That could never be replicated. So because it could never be replicated, the IDSA guidelines that came out in 2019 said, we do not, do not need to give routine steroids. The only indication would be refractory shock, right? So, so to Marillo's point, um, you've done everything you can. This woman is now hypotensive. Um, she's basically being transferred to the ICU. Um, you would give sort of uh, 
steroids is almost like a presser um, alternative, right? It, it wouldn't be for a floor patient who's just looking sick. Does that make sense? And I went back and, and looked at it again because they even said, and I added this line here, we do not routinely suggest using steroids for severe flu because it's like they've been so, so successful with, with COVID. You would think they would work with the flu, um, but they still, again, this is 2019. This is pre-COVID, these guidelines. <clears throat> Maybe something will change. Um, so a viral PCR actually comes back and that astute um, uh, pharmacist has an aha moment. And this lady actually has the flu because you're sitting in December. Um, and so uh, let's see, Bailey, what, what an antiviral would you add or would you add anything? She's already been in the hospital, let's say three days now. Um, I probably wouldn't add anything. She's probably going to kick it herself, like just get better from it. Yeah, like supportive care. That's just my opinion. Anyone feel free to chime in. You're, you're like team immunity. You've got this. You're going to beat the, this. The Tamiflu would, would, wouldn't work after three days. So you're really stuck. Yeah. So all of the Oseltamivir data is that um, if you give it within 48 to 72 hours of onset of symptoms, it's going to help. And if not, it doesn't help. Uh, However, uh, hospitalization is a completely different beast. And so if someone's hospitalized, if they're sick enough to be in the hospital, uh, you give them that oseltamivir. Okay. And if this is flu, right, keep thinking about co-infection. The interesting data about flu that I stuck here was all of the flu autopsies, uh, one in three had a bacterial co-infection. Okay. So again, like just because she comes back with the flu, you don't just throw her antibiotics out. You keep thinking about whether or not you need to continue antibiotics. You know, what are, what are the symptoms she's still exhibiting that might be more bacterial versus flu. But for everyone in the hospital that, that tests positive for the flu, you give also time of year, uh, regardless of symptom uh, duration. Um, and so how long would you continue antibiotics for? You've, you've basically now got her on ceftriaxone, azithro, um, also tamivir. So if they're getting better, right? If this little old lady is walking around your wards, high-fiving the nurses, um, eating her food like a champ, and looking forward to going back to her nursing home, five days is enough, right? But if she's still sitting there looking sickly, still coughing, low-grade temp, you continue for longer. So it's really all based on how they're looking clinically. If they're looking good, five days is more than enough for CAP and seven days for hospital acquired pneumonia or ventilator acquired pneumonia. Okay, five and seven. I have a question. Mm -hmm. um, why does hospitalization change Tamiflu usage? Uh, mortality. So all of the data they looked at um, where people got oseltamivir had slightly better mortality outcomes. And that may just be because they were getting better attention. I don't know. <laughs> Who knows? Um, but it's one of those uh, medicines that has really few side effects um, and it's not super costly and it's quite easily available. I'm sure we would have done more work if it was costlier. And so she's in a really good mood and she says, uh, Dr. Bertassi, you've done just a fabulous job. I really appreciate all your help. Can you see me in the office? And you're like, no, I don't have an office, but thanks. Um, but she says, hey, do I need to take another um, CT since like you found this on CT or at least a chest x-ray? Do when do I need to take another one? I saw Jonas somewhere. Now Jonas is gone. Where is Jonas? Oh no. Oh, there he is. I see you. Okay. Jonas, you're muted or you're not, but I can't hear you. You have a busted mic. It's okay. Next lecture. Sherelle, do you want to give it a go? Um, well, I think for me, it's not necessary to like repeat an x-ray or do a CT unless the patient is like hemodynamically unstable and the, the antibiotics are not working. So then we can like continue. Good, yeah. So, I mean, <clears throat> she's doing great. Like she's chilling, right? She's just told you she's going back to her nursing home. No worries in life. She's, this is really, the question really goes back to, I don't know if you guys, maybe you're, you're young, so much younger, 
when you would get a pneumonia and they'd be like, well, once you recover from the pneumonia, we should repeat an x-ray in six weeks to look for a hidden malignancy that may have triggered the pneumonia in the first place. This is what this question alludes to. And um, IDS say that uh, published in 2019, actually that they, they wanted to clarify this. They do not recommend repeating imaging for a simple pneumonia unless they have other risk factors. And that just goes back to smoking screening and, and the sort of CTs we do for our you know, heavy smokers, right? But routinely, you do not need to repeat imaging to look for resolution of pneumonia. Make sense? Um, and so these are just, I just stuck these here. If anyone gets really excited about reading about pneumonia, the, the guidelines are actually really well written. They have specific clinical questions and then the answers to those clinical questions and then also the references to the studies. Um, so anyone who's going into infectious disease or hospital medicine or even um, general internal medicine, give this a read. It's a really well written article. And this is just a quick table from the same um, guidelines which says what the 2019 guidelines have done a really good job of covering this kind of like a self-advertisement for them. But I, I really do think they kind of went out of their way and, and talked about things that needed to be talked about, like the use of procalcitonin, John's favorite, uh, use of corticosteroids. Um, you know, uh, who should you be checking cultures for? Who should you not be checking cultures for? Um, and then uh, we're gonna skip this. You can read this in your own time. Um, we haven't had a IDSA guideline for hospital and ventilator acquired pneumonia since 2016, but these are also very well written and worth a read, um, especially if you're going to palm crit. Um, and that's it. Five minutes left to spare. Can I ask another question? Yes. Would you make a distinction between someone who came from a nursing home with a pneumonia versus came from home, had a community acquired pneumonia, and then went to recuperate in a nursing home? on when you would do follow-up imaging? On when I would do follow-up imaging. So or I just if said you that- you would do follow-up imaging. So that, that's what I just said, is we wouldn't do follow-up imaging. I don't know, I know. So if someone had it from say outside, but what if someone was more high risk coming from a nursing home, you might think they were aspirating and they were going back to their nursing home. You would still not do a follow-up? Yeah, again, I think, you know, for aspiration, all of the all of the sort of expert consensus says you follow sort of clinical signs. If they're re-aspirating, if they're, you know, developing, again, features of an aspiration pneumonia, you re-image, but you don't need to routinely re-image just because someone is high risk for aspiration pneumonia. Um, again, if it's very patient dependent, if you have a patient who's at high risk for undiagnosed malignancy for whatever other risk factors they have, you image according to that. Um, but you know, it doesn't make a difference if they're coming in from the true community or sort of the nursing home subset. And the reason I bring it up is it's not so easy to get an x-ray as an outpatient, especially if someone is in a nursing home. There's a few nursing homes that will try to treat these things on their own, or they'll actually bring in a mobile x-ray place. And some will even do IV antibiotics for a short course to prevent a hospitalization. Yeah. But it's not that easy to get a simple x-ray in an outpatient person, even someone who's gone home too, right? They still have to go. It's much easier to get it if you're in the hospital and someone's wheeling them there than if you have an elderly person who needs to go to, you know, a place that's blocks away to get a follow-up x-ray. So I think this is actually an improvement because before we used to have these pe people traipsing around everywhere for no mm -hmm. real good indication. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. Yeah. Any other questions? Feel free to put it in the chat or just unmute yourselves. Hey guys, thanks for being so talkative today. I think you guys participated quite a bit. Um, sorry. I, for 